Well, hello again. It's good to be talking with you again today. Uh, today we're going to do a lesson which is uh, one that's very near and dear to my heart. The truth of this lesson has saved my life physically more than once. And then uh, we've been in ministry now for quite a, quite a long time. And we have lots and lots of messages available uh, by way of uh, the internet and CDs and MP3s. And over these years, with hundreds and hundreds of messages available, uh, the one that I'm going to teach you today is the most requested single uh, message that I've ever taught. And the title that I put on it is called Truth Changes Fact. Truth Changes Fact. Uh, you can be opening your Bible if you'd like to follow along to Mark 5. Uh, we'll be there uh, here in just a little bit. Uh, one day while I was in prayer, the Holy Spirit uh, just asked me a question. And I had been uh, just praying in the Spirit for quite a while. I wasn't really, uh, I didn't have questions up before the throne. You know, sometimes you do. But this day I was just really fellowshipping uh, in the Spirit, praying in other tongues, letting those mysteries be communicated between my Spirit and the Spirit of God. And I heard uh, I heard the Lord ask me, he, he asked me three questions. Now, first off, let me tell you this. God knows everything. Whenever God the Holy Spirit asks you a question, he's not really looking for information. <laughs> he doesn't really expect you to explain something to him that he doesn't understand. No, asking questions is a very good teaching tool. Jesus used that all the time. You'll see it in the parables. What what say ye? You know, and then he'll, he'll ask him a question and, and see where they are, and then, then he can take them on from there. Well, the three questions that he asked me was this. Number one, what is fact? Number two, what is confession? And number three, what is truth? Well, the first place that I went to try and answer those questions, and again, he just wanted to get my mind to going down a certain path, I went to the, uh, I, in my office there, I had an American Heritage Dictionary, so I just looked it up to see what it said. And the American Heritage Dictionary defines fact as something presented as objectively real. Something presented as objectively real. Uh, it gives the definition for the word confession as the act of admitting to something, or you could say acknowledgement. So the act of admitting to something or to acknowledge something. And then three, the, the definition it gave for truth is reality or another alternate actuality. Now, Jesus forever gave us the definition of truth. I mean, Jesus is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. Uh, he, he, he is truth. When, when he gives you a definition of something, you know, the expression we use here, you can take it to the bank. I mean, it, it's the end of all debate. Uh, if he says this is what it is, it's what it is. Well, you can read it for yourself in John 17, 17. Jesus, uh, what we call the high priestly prayer of Jesus. He said, he was praying to the Father, and he said in John 17, 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Then he defines what truth is. He says, Thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. So according to Jesus, what is real and what is actual, what is truth, is what God's word says about you. Your confession of God's word is simply admitting to the real truth. Confession is acknowledging the truth. Now, when I say the word confession, I'm not really talking about uh, in religious circles or religious terms when you use the word confession, uh, the first thing that comes to people's mind is like the, uh, the Catholic confession box, you know, where the priest sits there and you come and they slide the little door open and and uh, how long has it been since your last confession? And you confess your sins. Well, there's a, there's a place for confessing your sins. James says, confess your faults one to another 
that you might be healed and, and uh, you know, we're to confess our sins before the Lord and ask for his forgiveness, then the blood of Jesus is available to us to cleanse, not only forgive us, but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is one aspect of the word confession. But what to, for today's lesson, what I'm talking about is when you say what God's word says about you. The most common example that we use all the time is Abraham. Abraham's original name was Abram, A-B-R-A-M. And God had promised him and his wife that they would have a baby from their own loins. Well, they got to be about 100 years old, and they had never had a baby between the two of them. Abraham had had offspring through a, an Egyptian maid, but Abram and Sarah had never had a child. Now they're 100 years old, and we're told that uh, Sarah, with her, she was, it said she was past the time of the way of women. <laughs> That's a very polite way of saying she was past menopause. There was no, no eggs being produced anymore that even could be fertilized. Then with Abraham, Abram at the time, Abram, um, when God told Sarah that she was going to have a baby, at about 100 years old, she laughed and she said, will I again have pleasure from my husband? And that's a real polite way of letting us know that Abram was like a 100-year-old man. He wasn't very virile uh, in, anymore. So I think that's... We've got the picture here, okay. So, <laughs> so in the natural, there was just no way that this could happen. It was an absolute impossibility. Yet God says, you're going to have this baby. So God did two things, and I, I teach on this often because this is the foundation of faith. God's word works this way. Faith works this way. What God did, he did two things with Abram. First, he took him out of the tent on a starry night, a real clear night out in the desert. And uh, if you've ever been in the desert on a, on a clear night when there's not much moon, and uh, I used to drive those trucks between Amarillo and, and uh, Albuquerque, and you'd get out there in the desert. I mean to tell you, you can, you, I pulled over one time because the star, I had just never seen the sky so full of stars, just more stars than I'd ever seen. You know, I live in a city now, and, and at night there's so much light you can't really see the stars. But imagine what it was like for Abram in the desert on a, on a starry night. God takes him outside the tent, and he says, Now, I want you to look at those stars. Can you count those stars? I can imagine Abram looking. He's thinking, if I took the rest of my life, I could never count all those stars. And God says, That's the image I want you to have. Your seed, you know, in other words, the children, the offspring that are going to come from you, they shall number like the stars of heaven. So first thing God did was change what Abraham was seeing. See, Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us that now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. When it says hoped for, hope has everything to do with what you see on the inside. Well, what had Abram and Sarah seen for a hundred years? If you'll allow me, they'd, they'd seen an empty crib. You know, if they, if they, they always wanted to have children, maybe, they, maybe they'd prepared a, a crib, you know. But all they'd ever seen, as far as children from themselves, was an empty crib. So they had a vision, a hundred years of experience telling them, you're barren, you'll never have children, now look at you, you're past past childbearing age, both of your bodies, Sarah's body's not even producing eggs anymore. There's, there's no way. So hopelessness. So God, he, he takes them out and he gives him hope. He gives him a vision. That's half of what Abram needed. Then God changes Abram's name to Abraham. Abraham, the Hebrew language carries a, a meaning with every name. So the, the name Abraham means, I am the father of a multitude. I am the father, not I will be. It's I am the father of a multitude. Faith believes in the heart and says with the mouth. Look what God is doing. He's changing what Abraham sees. Ab oh, now it's Abraham. He's changing what he sees in his heart, in his, on the inside of him where your hope is. He's going... Sarah, I don't care that we're 100 years old. I don't care we've been trying to have children for 100 years. God, come here, Sarah, come here. Come outside this tent. Look, look up there. God showed me those stars, and he said our 
children, our seed, our descendants are going to number like the stars of heaven. And think of what that was like to Sarah. They're going, she's going, what? Because all see, life's experience, let me say it this way, I'm starting to get you going down this path. Life's facts, the facts of life for a hundred years, we are barren. We've tried and tried. We can't have children. More facts. Now I'm past menopause in Sarah's mind. No woman in the history of the world that's past menopause has ever become pregnant in a natural way. Of course, today we have, in, we have other means in vitro, but in their day, there was absolutely no other way. So the facts for Sarah was 100 years, almost 100 years of life tells me I'm barren. Now the facts are I'm past menopause. That tells me I'm barren. The, the, there's, there's, no, there's no possibility. So God, he comes with his word. And he changes what they're seeing. He's going, no, I don't want you to be limited by facts. I have something for you that is greater than those facts. Are you starting to get this? And he says, no, you are going to have children. And not only are you going to have children, you're going to have descendants that are going to number like the stars of heaven. So he starts with, starts with hope. Then the other half of faith, faith believes in the heart. That's the hope. And then says with the mouth. How did God do that for Abram? He just changed his name. So every time Abram says his name, he is making a positive confession, agreeing with what God said about him. So, hello, how are you? What's your name? I am the father of a multitude. Uh, every time he says his name, he is saying what God says. I am the father of a multitude. I am the father of a multitude. Now they had the hope on the inside. Now they're, they're believing it in the heart, saying it with the mouth. And do you know what? It changed their facts. Their bodies changed. They started ovulating again. Is that the right word? Began ovulating again. Apparently, in fact, actually, Abram, Abraham got overhealed. You know, they had Isaac. Later on, you'll find out after Sarah died, he took another wife and he had more children by her. <laughs> I mean, this, this fella got healed. Okay. But what caused that? God's word changed the literal facts. It changed it. And that's not the only example we have. I had you turn to Mark 5 because I just love this story uh, because it's so today. Uh, you know, being in ministry, uh, Sue and I are always dealing with people, uh, ministering to people that, that contract all kinds of diseases or have things in their body, you know, and and we thank God for medical science. I'll tell you what, if I've got a headache, I'll take the aspirins and thank, thank God for the aspirin and confess my healing till it comes. But I am sure thankful for that aspirin. I know the devil didn't put aspirin in the, in the earth to, to bless me. It was God, you know. And so I thank God for medical science and everything they can do. But see, sometimes medical science comes to the end of what they can do. Now, for example, here's a lady, um, Mark 5. We'll start in verse 25. It says, a certain woman which had an issue of blood for 12 years. If I was preaching to you right now, I'd say, say 12 years. The reason is we go by that too fast. 12 years. That is a long time. If you've had a disease, or like this, whatever this issue of blood is, if you've had it for 12 years, it starts painting an image in your mind, like a, I'm doing that because like the, the brush strokes, you know, of a painting. It's painting an image that you're going to always be that way. It's always going to be this way with you. And besides that, look, she, she went to the doctor, it says at verse 26, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and get this, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. Well, I'm telling you, that's, that's not real uncommon today. I mean, the doctors, I thank God for them. Um, I know a lady that's had uh, two surgeries by the most qualified doctors. That they're the best that, that, that can be had for money-wise. Yet today, if anything, she's prob I think she's worse than she was before they started. And there's really nowhere else to go. Now, so that's... You could take all kinds of cases. You know, doctors today still can't do a whole lot with birth defects. If, you're, if a person's born blind, most likely they're going to stay blind their whole life. If there's another lady that uh, 
that, that I know of it had a child born with only the brain stem. The brain itself did not really form. The child is conscious, it's a, aware, but without some kind of intervention by God, medical science really has no help for her. And I could go on, let's just take cases like, uh, well, we could just go on and on. You, you, know, you know that the doctors, we thank God for them, but just like this lady, you, you can be going to doctors for 12 years, spend all that you have, come to the end of your insurance, and still not be any better than you were before. Okay, that's the facts. Let's just lay it out. That's the facts. This lady here, she had had this issue of blood for 12 years. Went to the different doctors, phys physicians, spent all her money, and was she better? She was worse. So that's the facts. Well, let's just see what happens now. <laughs> Verse 27. When she had heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, she what? She used her mouth, and she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. I didn't bring an Amplified Bible with me today, but if you'll look this up in the Amplified and look it up in each of the Gospels where it appears, in the Amplified Bible from the Greek language, what that really says is she continually said. She said it again and again. She didn't just say it one time. She she says, well, I've been to all these doctors. Uh, I've spent all my money. She began to hear about Jesus, that where he goes, every, you know, whoever he prays for, they get healed. Whoever he lays hands on, they get healed. So she's going, well, if he's, if he's that, if I can just touch the hem of his clothes, I'll be healed. Now, see, the thing of it is, in the Jewish law, the, the time that she was under, this is a Jewish lady, and she was under the law, if she had an issue of blood, she really wasn't supposed to go out in public. But yet she risked everything to come to Jesus. By the way, I recommend that. <laughs> Risk everything to come to Jesus, okay? No matter who tells you it's impossible, no matter who says it can't be done, no matter who says it's illegal, I'm telling you right now, risk everything. Go to Jesus. Come to his word. I'm thinking right now of the blind man by the side of the road, and he was Jesus was passing by, and he heard about it. So he started shouting out, Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. And everybody's trying to get him to shut up. You know, be quiet. Don't trouble him. So what did he do? He shouted even louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. He would not be denied. He risked everything to get to Jesus. And Jesus noticed it, said, You bring him here to me. You know what happened? Truth changed his facts, too, and he left seen. That's good stuff. Well, let's get to this lady here. Now, she, she's by her own mouth. Now, she's sitting. Uh, some people call this a point of contact uh, in, in, uh, when they're teaching about faith. Sometimes uh, people need a point of contact. Okay, at the moment, I'm going to do this. Well, her, her point of contact for her, she said it herself. When I touch his clothes, I'll be made whole. When I touch his clothes... I'll be made whole. Now watch. Verse 29. Oh, okay. Uh, verse 27 again. When she had heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway, immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. 12 years, 12 years, more than a decade, the facts just kept getting worse. You ever been in a long battle? I mean, 12 years, and you, you're going to the doctors, and they send you to specialists, and finally you come to the end of everything, and they have no hope, and you have no more money and no more insurance. I'm telling you, you can come to Jesus. You hear me? His truth will change your facts. It did hers. He's no respecter of persons. In fact, really, you'll see here, it was her faith that made her whole, not his. Look, so verse 30, And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue, that, that power, had gone out of him, he turned about in the press, and he said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitudes thronging thee, 
and sayest thou who touched me? And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, she came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. What saved her? His faith? Her faith. Now, faith, again, is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. If you're listening to me in today and, and, and maybe you've, you or a loved one has been in a bad uh, physical situation for a long time, maybe 10 years, maybe 12 years, maybe it's been so long now, maybe 100 years, I mean like Abraham and Sarah, and by now, it, it's hopeless. By now, it's hopeless. You, there's just no, everyone, every doctor you see, every specialist, they tell you the same thing. There's no hope for you. There's no hope for you at all. Yes. Years ago, I heard a, I heard a minister teach about a lady named Holda, and he would always talk about Holda, Holda with no hope and no hair. This lady, she had cancer that had spread all through her body. And she it was very much like this woman in the Bible. She had gone to every physician. She had done everything that they had said. They, they had already done chemo and radiation, whatever it was. Now, this was quite a few years ago. I heard about this lady in the 80s. That's a while back, I know. So technology's progressed. But at that time, they finally just told her, says, ma'am, there is nothing else we can do for you. She had lost all of her hair, which is a horrible thing for a woman. Uh, you know, the, every treatment that they had done, she, just like this lady here in Mark, she only grew worse. And now they're saying, there's just no hope. There is nothing at all that we can do for you. Well, she had been to, uh, she'd heard a lesson similar to what I'm teaching you today, that, that in God there is no such thing as no hope. His word, I, I, his truth, which Jesus said, Father, thy word is truth. His word, his truth will change your fact. So she just got a hold of his word and she got two or three healing verses. I'm not exactly sure now. It's been too long since I heard it, which ones. But she just began speaking God's word over her exactly the same way that Abraham spoke God's word over himself. She found verses like, it may not have been these, there's a lot of healing verses, but like, as an example, she might have said something like himself, bore my sicknesses and carried my pains and by his stripes I am healed. One of my favorites is from the Old Testament. It says he blesses my bread, he blesses my water and he takes sickness away from the midst of me. Here's another one that I like from the Old Testament. It says with long life he'll satisfy me and show me his salvation. Well whichever ones it was that she chose, she put them on these little three by five cards and she'd just been confessing them for hours at a time. She'd walk around her coffee table. You don't have to walk, but sometimes it just helps to be active. And she'd walk around the coffee table confessing, confessing, confessing God's word, confessing God's word. Did it look hopeless? Yes. Was it painful? I'm sure her body was probably racked with pain. Did it get better immediately? I don't think so. I think this went on for a long time as I remember the testimony. But Holda, with no hope and no hair, one day walked back into that same doctor's office, the one that, that had sent her home. And, and I'm sure he, was, he meant well. I'm sure he had compassion for her, but there was just nothing else medically they could do. One day she walks in. He didn't recognize her. You know why not? She had this beautiful, long, black hair again. She looked the picture of health. She walked in. She says, do you recognize me? He says, nope. He says, I'm Holda with no hope and no hair. <laughs> the one that you sent home to die. But Jesus has healed me. There is no such thing as no hope. In God, there is always hope. He is the God of all hope. The key is, have we learned to acknowledge his word? How to do that so that we give opportunity for truth to change your fact. Now, while we're here in Mark 5, did you know this lady with the issue of blood is really like sandwiched in between an event that went on with a man named Jairus? So let's back up just a little bit in that same chapter. You talk about changing the facts. 
Uh, back up to verse 22 of Mark 5, and we'll see. Uh, I'm looking up at the clock. If you see me do that, that's what I'm doing, <laughs> making sure we've got plenty of time. So uh, verse 22 says, Behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his, Jesus. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. And he besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. Now, how serious is that? My little daughter. I, I raised three girls. I have, I have a real heart for little daughters, I'm telling you. When Jairus comes, my little daughter is at the point of death. That's serious. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and that she, may, and that she will, shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people f followed him and thronged him. And then, then begins that story that we just read about this woman with the issue of blood. Now, can you put yourself in Jairus' place? I mean, you're, it's serious. His daughter is at the point of death. You've gotten Jesus' attention. You're headed to your house so he can heal your daughter. And then this woman comes, almost like an interruption. And now this is going on, and put yourself in his shoes. It's like, okay, uh, lady, I'm, I'm glad you got healed. Uh, Jesus, uh, <laughs> my daughter, you know, but he's... We're not told anything. Apparently, he was very polite. And, and, uh, but notice this. As soon as that woman was healed, and, and uh, Jesus said to her, Daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace and behold of thy plague. As soon as he said that, in fact, verse 35 says, While he yet spake, while he was saying that to her, to her there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain people which said, Thy daughter is dead. The words that no, no father ever wants to hear. Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further now? Facts don't get much worse than that. Facts don't get much more final than thy daughter is dead. You tell me where you can go on planet earth with our modern medicine. Once they're dead, that's it. Normally, that's the end of all hope. And I know this story is here for our, for our teaching. It's not that we're going to go around raising everybody. We're not going to go to the graveyard and start raising everybody. What's the point? There is no fact that is greater than your God. It's not over until you win. That's what, that's what this lesson is in here for. So anyway, here comes the facts. They were bad before. Now they've gotten worse. And your daughter is dead. Hopeless. End of story. Except it's not. Now look. Verse 36. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, and boy, this is what he's saying to you. This is what he's saying to me. Be not afraid. Afraid of what? The facts. Now listen, we don't deny facts. You understand me? Facts will kill you. <laughs> we're, we're not denying the facts. Jesus isn't either. He says, don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of them. Don't live in fear of the facts. You have access to truth, which will change the facts. And that's what he says. What does he say? Don't be afraid. Only believe. Believe what? Believe the word of God. Believe. You continue to believe. Verse 37. And he suffered no man to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and he seeth the tumult, <laughs> and them that wept and wailed greatly. I mean, uh, in that culture at that time, when something like that happened, there was a lot of weeping and grieving. And, of course, a lot of times that's still going on when somebody dies, you know. And when he was come in, he said unto them, why make you this ado and weep? Now notice this. Jesus will not speak in line with the facts. What are the facts? She's dead. That's the facts. Notice what Jesus said. The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. And notice they laughed him to scorn. When you start standing on God's word, people are going to laugh you to scorn too. What do you think people thought when they, when, I mean, when, you know, we read that about Abraham and we don't really take it 
like it, we can just read it like a story. But what, what would happen now if uh, Abram has lived in that area for years and everybody around there knows him and then after, after God changes his name to Abraham and everybody knows what names mean, the Hebrew language. So he goes to maybe a, a, a friend's house that he's known for years and, hey, Abram, I'm so glad to see you. I'm glad you showed up today. It's really good to see you. And Abram says, well, it's good to see you too, but I need to tell you something. My name is no longer Abram. It's not. What is it now? My name is Abraham. And as soon as the fellow hears that, he knows that that word means, I am the father of a multitude. And he's looking at him, a hundred-year-old prune. He looks at his wife. She's a hundred-year-old prune. And he's going, what? Yes, my name is Abraham, meaning I am the father of a multitude. And here it comes, you know. You know the next question is, who told you your name is Abraham? God told me. <laughs> Are you ready? This is the way they look at you. They go, oh, <laughs> oh, okay. And on the inside, it might have been polite, but on the inside he's thinking, the old man's been working out in the hot sun without his turban on. <laughs> you know, He's had heat stroke or something. He's lost it. Now God's talking to him, you know. But see, God had been talking to him. God's talking to you. He's talking to you today. He's talking to you through the Word of God. And he's looking to you. I don't care how bad your circumstances are. I don't care what the facts say. God's Word will change your facts. Jesus is saying to you today, do not be afraid. Only believe. Only believe. And they'll laugh you to scorn. They did him. Verse 40, they laughed him to scorn. But when he, they thought he was a fool. That's what they'll say about you too. But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him and entereth in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and he said unto her, Talitha kumai, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say to thee, arise. When, when God's word is spoken in faith. There is no such thing as too late. There is no such thing as this problem's too hard. There is no such thing as it's over, it's too late. When God's word is spoken in faith, truth changes fact. Well, facts don't get much worse than dead. <laughs> but his word even changed that. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of 12 years. And they were astonished with a great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it and commanded that something should be given her to eat. Now, isn't that something? Isn't that something? Well, my problems, yes, Gary, I, I know that uh, I know God's good and God's a healer, but you don't know my situation. I mean, my situation is really bad. Is it worse than death? <laughs> You're telling me you're... Your situation, your, your particular set of facts are more worse than Jairus' daughter. It doesn't get any worse than that. We could go, I could go case after case. What about, yeah, okay, my daughter, my problem is not so much uh, uh, health. I've got a daughter on drugs. You know, we could turn right now to the, the Canaanite woman. You can look it up later. We've got too many scriptures. Remember that Canaanite woman that came and, she had a daughter that was grievously vexed of a devil. Now, we're not told exactly how that was manifesting. But if you don't think devils are involved in drug possession, I, I think they are, you know. Just like angels influence people to do good, demons influence people to do bad. And the devil loves to get our young people strung out on drugs, you know. Well, anyway, whatever this devil was, now this Canaanite woman, at that point in history before the resurrection, while Jesus was walking the earth physically, the Canaanites had no covenant with God. Only Israel, only the Jews had a covenant with God. And she came to Jesus and she said, Master, my daughter lieth at home. She's gre She didn't even have her daughter with her. This is long distance intercession. She says, my, my daughter lieth at home, grievously vexed of a devil. It could have been sickness. It could be some kind of possession. It could have been drugs or alcohol or I don't know what it was. But it was demonic, whatever it was. And Jesus first said to her, healing is the children's bread, meaning you have no covenant with God. During that dispensation right then, they, she didn't. 
But you know what? That woman had faith. She had such faith. She's, she believed that God was even bigger than that covenant. She says, truth, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the children's, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the children's table. Meaning, God, you're bigger than this. I know my God, I know God is bigger than this covenant. There's got to be enough left over, even from the crumbs, for my daughter to be healed. Boy, he turned to her and he said, woman, great is thy faith. And her daughter was delivered from that same hour. There is no such thing as hopeless. You may have you may have children that are on drugs or drinking or just doing anything. Find God's word. There's all kinds of promises in God's word about your children. Sue and I had to do this for our children years ago when they were, they, you know, our children. We had three daughters. They're two years apart, so they were all three teenagers at the same time. I'll just tell you right now, I pray for any family that has three teenage children all at the same time because they all kind of went into rebellion, all three of them in the same years, and, and we didn't really know what to do, and the devil just kept beating our brains out because here's our children, you know, they're, they, they weren't raised like this, and now they're just, without getting into great detail, it wasn't good. They were just drinking and carousing and doing a lot of things that they shouldn't be doing. Well, the natural tendency is to do the opposite of God's word. And, you know, I didn't raise you like this. How come you're acting like this? Nya, 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 nya. <laughs> you just own them all the time. All that does is drive them further into rebellion. So what happened with us, thank God, at that point in our lives, we had already learned this truth that I'm sharing with you today. We took God's word and we began confessing, acknowledging. Here, we're going to get into this. Now, what does confession mean? It is the act of admitting to something. It is to acknowledge that something is so. We took God's word, which is truth, and we began to acknowledge, to admit to that, to say that over our daughters instead of what the current facts were. So if you say, well, how are you, you know, if most people at that time, if, if, if they were asked, well, how are your daughters doing? You know, how, the, how are they doing? But the tendency is to tell it like it is. Oh, we're so worried. Our daughters are out there. We're afraid they're going to have a car wreck and be out drinking and driving. And, oh, God, they're messing around with these bad people. And we don't, you know, you just go on and caterwaul for however long, you know. And, and then they start telling you about their problems. And pretty soon, you know, we've got a big, you know, uh, what do you call it? Pity party going on, I guess, you know, pity party. That is so opposite of what God says to do. God says, you put my word in your mouth. My truth will change your facts. So we, we practiced at home first. Sue and I, would we found scriptures that covered our case like our daughters are the handmaidens of the Lord. They prophesy the word of God. They, they don't speak any perverse things. Our daughters are sanctified from this world. They're holy unto the Lord our God. And we would just do that and do that till we were full. We ourselves had to get full because facts will beat you down, boy. I mean day in, day out, and you don't see any change and it's bad and it looks like it's getting worse, facts have a tendency to wear you out, just to wear you down. Pretty soon you're just wanting somebody to just pat you on the back or something. That, that's okay. I guess that helps the emotions a little bit, but it doesn't change anything. What changes the facts is God's Word. So we got ourselves full at home confessing the Word ourselves, and we were full. We didn't have to when, when somebody asked us then, we'd be out, you know, just doing what we do. Well, how's, how's Angie doing? How's Aaron doing? My daughter is a handmaiden of the Lord. She's holiness unto the Lord my God. She's sanctified by, this, by the word of God. And everything she does is righteous and pure. And pretty soon they go, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> it still took a long time. That's the reason I said, do you remember that 12-year thing earlier? <laughs> you know, it didn't happen on a dime. It didn't happen in a week. It didn't happen in a year. It took several years, but I want you to know every single one of our daughters came back to the Lord. God protected them. We spoke verses, His Word that would keep them protected. None of them were damaged permanently. Uh, no you know, terrible car wrecks or anything. And they all wound up serving the Lord. All three of them wound up working for a season with us in the ministry. Since then, things have changed a little bit. But God's Word again changed the facts. I don't want you to think it's just healing. That was a case of rebellious daughters. You, you can change anything. You can change your own finances. 
You can change it by speaking God's word. Well, I, wanna, I don't want to leave out certain sections here now. Go ahead and, and I want you to look at this. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I want to look at verses 25 and 26. I'm not going to turn there. I've already got them printed out on this paper. And by the way, of course, I'm using a King James Bible, which is what I normally use. I'll give you just a moment. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We'll start in verse 25. Got that? Got it? Okay. In meekness, instructing those, this is, this is what I'm doing today. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. See, very often we, we don't realize we're opposing ourselves. When we just go out and we're just saying what is, we are only reinforcing what already is. Abraham learned he had to call those things which be not as though they were. I am the father of a multitude. That's where the power is. God's word then changes your fact. But there is no power to change what is if you're only saying what is because it already is. <laughs> you got that? It already is. So there's no power to change it. No, you take God's word, call those, like Abraham did, don't say, I will be the father of a multitude. No. I am the father of a multitude. My daughters are holiness unto the Lord my God. My daughters do prophesy. Or by his stripes I am healed. Himself blesses my bread, blesses my water, takes sickness away from the midst of me. I am healed and I am whole. That's the way that you do it. Well, anyway, 2 Timothy 2, verses 25 and 26. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance, now notice, repentance to what? To the acknowledging of the truth. The most recent example I have of that in my own life. But now, a few years ago, maybe five, I guess five or six years ago now, uh, I started having real problems with my back. And it came on so gradual. I mean, it was like, you ever watch grass grow? <laughs> you, know, you, you can't really tell that it's growing, but it is growing all the time. That's the way this was. It was slow, <clears throat> insidiously slow. <clears throat> Hang on a minute. I need a little, little drink of coffee here. <clears throat> it was so slow that I didn't recognize it as being an assault from the enemy. Normally, I'm pretty good. You know, if something comes up in our life and I, it's not, it's not uh, edifying, it, I recognize that's an attack from the enemy and I'll immediately get out God's word and begin doing what I'm teaching you today, which is to begin acknowledging it, to begin confessing it, to begin using God's truth to change the facts. But this one came on me so gradual. It's like watching grass grow or watching paint dry. <laughs> and I just didn't see it. It was over a span of years, but it eventually got so bad that I was walking like a hundred year old man. If I was I'd have to bend up, I'd stand up and bend over at a 45. I mean, I just couldn't stand up hardly beyond that. And even that was hard. I'd have to, I couldn't walk just a little ways. I'd have to sit down again. My back, the pain in my back was so bad and, and getting worse all the time. And the thing of it is, I was opposing myself without realizing I was doing that. I wasn't acknowledging the truth, like it says here. I was just going around saying with my mouth, my back is killing me. <laughs> Isn't that a great confession? My back. I'd say things to my, my wife. Man, I'm telling you, if this gets any worse, I'm going to be in a wheelchair. I thought, I'm probably never going to get to preach overseas again. And just, I mean, I was just exactly what it says here in 1 Timothy 2.25. Without realizing I was doing it, I was opposing myself by not acknowledging the truth. What was I doing? I was acknowledging the facts. I was confessing the facts. I was saying the facts like, like that's the end of the story. One day, my, my wonderful, beautiful, lovely wife that I treasure so much, Sue. Now, she did it with respect and she did it with love, but she did it very firmly. She just came up to me, did her finger kind of like this right towards my nose <laughs> and said, if you don't change what you're saying, the devil is going to put you in a wheelchair and steal all the rest of your ministry. My first, my, I'm trying to be, we're family, right? 
my first thought was a little bit of anger. I'm going, hey, I teach this stuff. <laughs> but I just that was just flashed, and then I went, she's absolutely right. I got to thinking about my mouth and the things I had been saying, and I'm going, what's wrong with me? How could I not have recognized that this was an attack of the devil? All I could do was repent. Exactly what it says here. Look at this. Look at it again. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So I began to acknowledge the truth. How do you do that? Here you go again. I got out, you know, I go find my old confession sheets for healing, get them out, blow the dust off of them you know, <laughs> figuratively. And I had to start saying them again. Now, I'm telling you, it did not change overnight. In fact, if you want to know the real truth, it got worse for a while. One of the things that I teach on this, I'm looking at the clock again. One of the things that I teach along this line, I, we go to James, and I believe it's chapter 3. Uh, let's go over there real quick. Stay in Timothy. We're going to come back to Timothy. Hold a finger there. But let me, let me read you this in James. Oops, went too far. Um, and I believe it's chapter 3. Yes. He says uh, in uh, chapter 3, verse 3, Behold, let's see. We'll just start in verse 2. In many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect, that means mature man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths. Where do you put them? In the mouth. That, we, that they may obey us and we may turn their whole body. That's one example. The, the, the one I like even better is the one about the ships. Now notice this, verse 4. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great. Now, so it's a big ship. We're not talking a canoe here. A great ship. I like to think about Think about one the size of the Queen Mary, okay? I mean, we're talking a big ship. Though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor lists. And you can see that picture, even if it's the Queen Mary and it's going in a certain direction, even the winds are blowing. You know the captain can give the signal to change their little rudder on the back of that ship. And as long as they keep that rudder changed, it may take a while, but that thing is going to turn. The direction of that ship will change. Well, how do you, how do you change the rudder? Here it is, verse 5. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. The tongue is how you do it. He's given the analogy, this great ship, even though it's driven of fierce winds and it's going in a certain direction, you can change it just by changing the rudder. He's comparing that to your life and he's saying, look, it may have been this way a long time with you, but if you'll learn to take that tongue like the rudder on the ship and you begin to, how do you change the tongue? Well, instead of what I was doing, which was speaking the facts, speak the truth. Speak God's word over the facts. So I began to do exactly that. Same, same as always. I, himself bore my sicknesses and carried my, hit my pains and with his stripes I am healed. He blesses my bread. He blesses my water, takes sickness away from the midst of me. On and on and on I began to say God's word. I was setting the rudder of my ship and I'm telling you, the pain was there. The pain, if anything, got worse for a while. See, that's the thing. We would like for, as soon as we start confessing, we'd like to have instantaneous results where the ship would turn. I wish it was that way. I've not, and it can be that way. I see Jesus got instantaneous results, but honey, I'm not Jesus. <laughs> I'm not as developed. You're, you're probably not either. M me and most of the people I know, it takes time. That's why James, I think, gives us this illustration. It's not a canoe. This is a great big ship. You got that ship, it's been going in a certain direction. For a long time, you changed the rudder. Well, yeah, it's beginning to turn all right. But from where you started changing that rudder to where it starts really turning around, it's been going that direction. It's going to keep going that way for a while. That's what happened with me as I began to confess God's word over my back and over my body. I'd speak to my back too. You know, Jesus said, you can say to the mountain and it'll obey you. 
Well, I began talking to my back. You ever talk to your back? <laughs> I said, back, I command you, be normal. I call my back healed in Jesus' name. Gary, how can you do that? The same way Abraham could call himself the father of a multitude before he had any children. I had God's word. By his stripes, I'm healed. He blesses my bread. He blesses my water. He takes sickness away from the midst of me. We could go into many more. He perfects that which concerns me. He renews my youth like the eagles. On and on and on. And I would say all of those things. And did it get better? No, it got worse like the Queen Mary. I'd, I'd been going that way a long time, but I, I refused. Once I reset that tongue, I reset the rudder of my ship, and I set it with God's word, I refused to acknowledge any more facts from that point on. Now, it got worse. It got quite a bit worse. It got to where I couldn't even stand up for seasons at a time. I couldn't even, you know, even at a 45-degree angle. But over time, it eventually turned, and it changed. And one day, it just, I said, whoa, that's better. I could better. And it's been getting better ever since. I've, I've been back to Asia again and preached God's Word two different years since that time. I've been everywhere and preached. I'm fixing to do some more meetings this year and travel all over the country and do, do, do. I'm, I'm not 100% from where I was before, but I'm about 95. And I'm still confessing God's word and I'll be better the next time you see me. Why? Because truth changes facts. Well, let's go back to Timothy here for a minute. I want to finish this, this little verse. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 25 and 26 again. In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. If they'll do that, then it says, and they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Now, that's scary. The devil can just take you captive at his will? How can he do that? Every, boy, if you don't get anything else out of this lesson, every fiery dart, every circumstance is aimed at your tongue. Your tongue is the rudder of your ship. Did you get that? Your tongue is the rudder of your ship, and every circumstance, every fiery dart is aimed to get you opposing yourself by speaking in line with those facts. What you need to do, we don't, Ignore the facts. Now, don't, again, don't take me wrong. We don't ignore the facts. We overcome the facts. We change the facts with God's Word. Truth changes facts. Now, I'm going to finish up this one part, and if we have time, I'll give you one more example. Okay? Let's go to Philemon. Philemon. I'm teasing. Chapter 1. There's only one chapter. <laughs> Let's go to Philemon. Verse 6 is the one I want to look at here. Now, this is a little King Jamesy, but it says that the communication of thy faith may become effectual. By, well, let's stop right there. The communication of your faith. When it says communication in the King James, it's not just talking about speaking like we use it today. Uh, your communication represents your manner of living. That your manner of living, your life of faith, let me say it that way, may become effectual. Well, what does that mean? Have an effect. It may produce, you know, there's cause and effect. And he's saying, you can come to the place where your faith life ha is a, becomes a causal force in the earth that will produce effects. And that's what we want. Not just pie in the sky. I want my faith to work, don't you? I want it to have, not just in my own body, if I need if I need something for my own body or for my family or for my children, when I pray for you, I want the communication of my faith. I want my, my life of faith to be effectual. I want you to have a good result. Well, how do we do that, Brother Gary? <laughs> well, that's Philemon. You're <laughs> well, actually, Paul writing to Philemon. So, well, how do you do that? By the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. How does it become effectual? By the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. How do you acknowledge something? Remember those three questions he asked me? What is fact? What is confession? And what is truth? The American Heritage Dictionary definition of the word confession, the act of admitting to something or acknowledgement. 
you got to start acknowledging God's Word. Whatever God's Word says about you in Christ Jesus, that is the truth. You have to begin to acknowledge that truth, just like I did the simple case with my back. I began to acknowledge God's Word. By His stripes I am healed. He himself bore my sicknesses and carried my pains. I acknowledge that is the truth. You bless my bread. You bless my water. You take sickness away from the midst of me. You perfect that which concerns me, Lord. You renew my strength like you do the eagles. Renew my youth like the eagle, Lord. And many other verses that I could, if I was fighting that battle, I'd have a, I'd have a sheet of them here, at least four or five of them, where I could be saying them, acknowledging them, confessing them, and I have now set the rudder of my ship. And it may take a while. It doesn't happen on a dime. But I mean, if I will set my rudder, set the rudder of my life with my tongue, According to God's word, I mean the Holy Spirit will shift the destination of my life and I'll have God's word. I'll have that effect, not only for me, but when I pray for you, glory to God. Now let, me, uh, let me read this little paragraph that I wrote here. We're getting close to the end of our time. Satan, through the physical senses, is always presenting facts to us that which is presented as being objectively real. But fact is not necessarily truth. As long as our confession is acknowledging the present tense facts in our lives, we will be held captive by the devil at his will. It's only when we repent and we begin to acknowledge the truth, what God's word says about us, and our confession lines up with the real truth that we begin to recover ourselves out of the snare of the devil who has been holding us captive by our factual confession up to that point. In Philemon it says the own excuse me, in Philemon it says that it is only when we begin acknowledging, confessing every good thing that is within us in Christ Jesus, that our lifestyle, our communication of faith begins to work for us becomes effectual. This is so simple, but it's so hard. It is so simple. I don't care what facts you're faced with. And we're not, I'm, I'm not saying ignore the facts. I'm saying change the facts. How do you change it? Your tongue is the rudder of your ship. You set your direction by only letting God's word and confessions based on God's word come out of your mouth. If you do that, God's truth will change your facts. Until the next time, this is Gary Carpenter saying, be blessed in Jesus' name.